Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier and please excuse the voice, I'm getting over a bit of a cold today. Anyway, today we are going to be looking at a fascinating piece of measurement equipment. This is called a Davis Ranger and this is produced by the Davis Instrument Corporation out of Oakland, California starting in 1969. And this is an example of what is typically known as a statiometer or statimeter, which is one of several common designs of optical rangefinders. Now the name statimeter or statiometer comes from the Greek stadion, which is an ancient unit of measurement equivalent to 600 Greek feet or podes. Now unfortunately the value of the podes actually varied from place to place and time period to time period, so we're not quite sure exactly how long a stadion was, with the value being estimated at between 190 and 220 feet. Though in the Middle Ages, in the British Isles, it was defined as equivalent to a furlong, which is 220 feet or one-eighth of a statute mile, and this is a unit of measurement still used to this day in horse racing. Yet, regardless of what the actual value of a stadion was, in its Latinized form, stadium, it gave us our modern word for a certain type of sports venue, as well as the names of several types of surveying instruments, the stadia rod and stadiometric rangefinding. Now, stadiometric rangefinding differs from other types of rangefinding in that you actually need to know the approximate size of the object whose range you're trying to measure. And by knowing the size of the object and the angle between you and that object, you can use the method of similar triangles in order to compute its distance. Now, the first modern statimeter was invented in 1769 by none other than James Watt of steam engine fame. He called his device a micrometer, and it was intended for use in surveying, such as laying out canals. And the micrometer consisted of a telescope with a reticle that had two horizontal lines and one vertical line. And it was intended to be used in conjunction with a stadia rod that had two points marked on it at a certain fixed distance. And how you would use this is that one surveyor would look through the telescope while the other would move the stadia rod back and forth until the two marks on the rod aligned with the two lines in the reticle. And since this only happened at a certain predetermined distance, this allowed you to mark out increments of that distance. And this was a lot faster than previous methods where you had to use a rope or a tape or a surveyor's chain to physically measure out distances. Hence why techniques like this are typically known as tachyometry from the Greek for quick measurement. But while Watt's system was faster than earlier techniques, it still required two people to carry out. And a couple of years later, in 1778, a German instrument maker named Georg Brander came up with a better system that could be operated by a single person, the Coincidence Rangefinder. And we've actually covered one of these devices previously on the channel, specifically this one. This is intended to be mounted on top of a camera to allow you to determine the distance to your subject and adjust the focus of your lens accordingly. So at their most basic, coincidence rangefinders consist of a long horizontal tube or box, what is known as the optical bar. On one end, you have a 45 degree semi-silvered mirror with an eyepiece. And on the other, you have a fully silvered mirror that can be rotated in the horizontal plane by turning a knob. And how you use this is you look through the eyepiece to your target and you rotate the knob until the little ghostly image reflected by the rotating mirror aligns with the actual image. And once you do this, you've created a right angle triangle between three points, the rotating mirror, your eye, and the object. And you know the length of one side, the distance between your eye and the rotating mirror, and you know the angle. And this allows you to determine the length of the other side, which gives you your range. And this can be set up in a number of different ways. This one has the ghost image, uh, others are split vertically or horizontally, and so you have to align both halves of the image until they look like an entire image. But while the basic design for the coincidence rangefinder was created in the 18th century, it wouldn't be until the end of the 19th that it would be perfected and brought into widespread use. And this is thanks to a pair of professors at the University of Leeds named Archibald Barr and William Stroud. 
And in 1891, they were contracted by the Royal Navy to create a number of optical instruments, including rangefinders for use aboard ships. And in 1895, they formed the firm of Barr and Stroud in Glasgow in order to manufacture these instruments. But they soon ran into problems because they found that their design was far too sensitive to changes in temperature, which made it inaccurate. And so they improved the design by A, manufacturing the optical bar, the actual tube out of metals with low coefficients of thermal expansion, and B, by replacing the mirrors at either ends with pentaprisms. Now, while this solved one problem, it created another because pentaprisms always refract light at 90 degrees, no matter what the angle of incidence, meaning you could no longer rotate the prisms as you could mirrors in order to adjust the image and find the range. And they solved that particular problem in a rather clever way using what were known as compensator wedges. And these were triangular prisms, which when aligned thick to thin edge produced no refraction. The light just passed through in a straight line. However, if they were rotated relative to one another, they caused the light to be deflected in the horizontal plane, creating an equivalent effect to rotating vertical mirrors. Furthermore, the ratio between the rotation of the prisms and the deflection of the light was very high. So if you rotated those prisms by 180 degrees, you would deflect the light by less than a degree. This allowed this style of rangefinder to achieve a high degree of accuracy. And so this became the standard rangefinding system in Royal Navy ships until the advent of radar. Now, around the same time, the German optical firm Zeiss came up with a similar but distinct system called the stereoscopic rangefinder. Now, this had two eyepieces instead of one so that the images coming from the prisms at either end of the rangefinder would be merged into a single 3D image. And instead of having to align two separate images of the target, you instead had to align a cursor with the center of the target using a knob. And this became the standard rangefinding system for the German Navy for several decades. Now, at the time, there was significant debate over which system was superior. The Germans argued that the stereoscopic system was better for vertically oriented objects such as shell splashes out at sea or aircraft. It was also better for use in low light and low contrast conditions. Whereas the British argued that not all sailors could use it because some sailors lacked good binocular vision and that the stereoscopic system produced significant eye strain over time. Though this was later questioned by American research. In the end, it turned out to be mostly a nationalistic debate with the British preferring to stick with the system that they invented and the Germans likewise. So for the sake of completeness, I will briefly mention another type of common naval rangefinder in use at this time, which was the depression rangefinder invented in 1881 by Royal Artillery Captain HSS Watkin. And despite the name, this wasn't a method for determining range by the amount of sadness of the enemy sailors, though that would have been a very accurate method, but rather this measured the angle between the rangefinder and the waterline of that other ship. And as with previous methods, this gave you a right triangle formed by the range between the two ships and the height between your ship's waterline and the rangefinder. And if you could find one of those angles, then you could easily determine the range to the other ship. In practice, however, these systems often required compensation mechanisms in order to account for the curvature of the Earth at long distances. And later, multiple depression rangefinders would be wired together electromechanically in order to create what was known as a depression position finder, or DPF. This allowed you not only to find the range to a particular target, but also its position relative to your ship, which allowed the guns to be automatically directed towards a particular target. But while all these different systems were about equivalent in accuracy, they all suffered from one major problem, which was that they were very big. You needed a large baseline in order to achieve great accuracy in range finding. And this meant that these systems were enormous. On many ships, they were the size of entire gun turrets. And while this is fine in combat, for more mundane tasks such as navigation or, say, station keeping, keeping an adequate distance between different ships in a fleet or a convoy, you're going to need something a little bit smaller and more convenient. And one such instrument was invented in 1890 by a remarkable gentleman named Rear Admiral Bradley Allen Fisk. Now, Fisk was born in 1854. He graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1874, and he was considered one of the great innovators in naval technology of his day. 
For example, in 1910, after observing a demonstration of early naval aircraft, he came up with the idea of arming those aircraft with lightweight torpedoes so that they could attack enemy ships in their own harbors, an idea that would prove extremely prophetic. He also came up with a number of other devices, many of which were integrated into U.S. naval ships over the following decades, including helm angle, speed, and direction indicators, engine room and steering telegraphs, gun direction mechanisms, ammunition hoists, and even radio-controlled torpedoes. And in 1890, Fisk patented a device which became known as the Fisk Statometer, which was a handheld instrument, very similar to a sextant, that allowed you to determine the range of an object with high accuracy, provided you knew the size of that object. And this was particularly handy out at sea, since you would typically have tables or diagrams showing you the main dimensions of ships in your own navy and that of the enemy. And so this was immediately adopted into the U.S. Navy and went through a number of different revisions over the following decades. And during the Second World War, they introduced the Mark V, which did away with the micrometer screw that was used to adjust the angle on previous versions in favor of a swinging arm, like on a sextant, which made it much faster to use. Now, in addition to navigation and station keeping, statimeters also saw extensive use in submarine periscopes, which were too small to hold any other type of range-finding system. And these ranged from very simple, where you just had a reticle that allowed you to estimate sizes and ranges, to more sophisticated ghost image or split image systems that could achieve a higher degree of accuracy and also compensate for factors like angle and speed. And it is rangefinders like this which led to the development of one of the weirdest camouflage schemes ever which was dazzle camouflage. So this was developed during the First World War, and it involved painting ships with garish black and white and other colored stripes. And the idea was to break up the ship's outline, making it difficult for a U-boat captain to successfully line up the different components of the ship in his periscope rangefinder. It also made it difficult to tell the bow from the stern of the ship, and thus difficult to tell its course. And also they would sometimes paint a dummy bow wave onto the hull to make determining its speed difficult. And these are all factors that are essential for accurately firing a torpedo. Now, another common application of stadiometric range finding is in the optical sights for marksman's rifles and anti-tank weapons. In both cases, you're going to be shooting at a target whose size you can estimate with a great degree of accuracy. So for example, if you're a sniper or a designated marksman, you're mostly going to be shooting at people whose height you can estimate to be anywhere between five and a half to six feet. And there are a number of different reticle designs intended to take advantage of this. Uh, one of the most elaborate is found in the Russian PSO-1 scope, and this consists of a horizontal line and a curved line with graduations along the curved line. And the idea is that you bracket a person between the two lines and then read off their range. Most rifle scopes, however, are set up with a mill dot system, which is a series of dots on the crosshair that allow you to determine the angular height of the target in milliradians. So a radian is defined as the angle of an arc where the length of the arc is equal to its radius. And a milliradian is one thousandth of this. And so if you know the approximate height of your target, and you also know its angular height by looking through your scope, you can easily determine the range by simply dividing its actual height by its angular height in radians. And this is something that snipers train long and hard to be able to do easily in their heads. So, let's finally have a look at the Davis Ranger, which is a distant descendant of the Fisk Statimeter. So unfortunately, this is all glued together. There are no actual screws or other fasteners, so I can't take this apart to show you how it works, but the mechanics are fairly simple and easy to work out. It's basically just a tilting mirror or prism driven by this knob. So to use this, first you have to choose an appropriate target, something that you know the height of with reasonable accuracy. So for example, when I first tried this out, I looked across my street and saw that my neighbor had a bunch of Adirondack chairs in their front yard, which were about four feet high. So I dialed in four feet on this black disc here. And you look through the eyepiece and you're going to see two images, the main image of your target and a transparent ghost image. And you have to turn the knob until the two are stacked one on top of another, just barely touching. This is distinct from, say, coincidence rangefinders, where you have to align both images one on top of another. And so once you have done that, then you 
pull the unit down and you read your range in one of these two windows. One will give you your range in yards, the other will give it in miles, both nautical and statute, indicated by an N and an S. What's interesting about this is that it doesn't actually give you your order of magnitude. It doesn't give you any decimals. You have to determine that for yourself. So in this case, I came up with a range of about 40 yards, which is reasonable given the width of an average residential street. But if I were looking further out, then I would go for, say, 400 yards or 4,000 yards. Now, if you happen to know the length of your target better than its height, you can actually turn the Davis Ranger on its side, and then you would stack the images of the target side to side rather than one on top of another. And if that object happens to be coming at an angle towards you, you can compensate for that as well by lining up the graduation for whatever the length of the object is with one of these compensation graduations for angle that are molded into the black disc just to the left of the indicator arrow. So for example, if you have an eight foot boat coming towards you at a 35 degree angle, you just align the 35 degree marking with the eight foot graduation and it will automatically compensate for the foreshortening caused by the angle. So overall, a very compact, clever, and handy little device. Uh, this is intended for all sorts of different applications, uh, for yachtsmen, for golfers to determine the distance of the next shot, for engineers and surveyors, all sorts of people. And it's a fascinating little descendant of a long line of very clever range-finding instruments. Anyways, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, despite my atrocious voice today. Uh, I'll see you next time on another video where we'll look at yet more fascinating instruments and other devices just like this one. Uh, I won't be posting anything for two weeks because I'm actually going off on vacation, which is why I wanted to get this video out despite my voice, but I will get you more fascinating content by the end of the month. Anyway, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.